Uh, hello and welcome to my talk. Thanks for wanting to check it out. This talk's called um, Browser Fingerprinting, uh, Stalking with a Personal Touch. First off, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Ivan Iveson. I work as a consultant at Bouvet here in Oslo. Uh, I mainly do architecture, tech leads type stuff, some advisory work. Uh, and I have experience from web development, AppSec, critical infrastructure in the energy sector, and um, the, the government uh, appointed expert group that evaluated the Norwegian solution for contact tracing uh, just recently, to, to mention a few things. I'm also a huge privacy nerd, and I write a bit about it every now and then. Uh, but on with the show. What if I told you it's completely possible to follow you around the web even after you close your incognito window? I know, right? And to a certain degree, even between browsers. How is this possible, you might ask? Well, as you might know, when you try to navigate to a web page, after a DNS lookup, your browser makes a resource request in the background. And this request can state things like what type of content your browser accepts as a response, acceptable languages, content encoding, user agent string, and so on. And all of these, all of these attributes describe uh, your browser or some of these attributes describe your browser to a certain extent. In addition, the server naturally also sees your IP address unless you're using proxies or VPN or some such. Uh, but as a response to this, the server will hopefully return uh, the requested resource, i.e. a web page, and display it to you and evaluate the, the accompanying JavaScript. But browsers differ in which features are implemented. And there's a difference in what technologies are supported and how they're supported between browsers. And even simple functionality can be implemented every, anywhere from according to spec to having quirks to not being supported at all. We can derive via CSS and JavaScript, such as resolution or color depth. And for instance, using HTML canvas, one can draw an element that's not displayed on the screen and based on the, the resulting data, i.e. what this element looks like, we can describe a, a browser relatively precisely. Or you could do basically some of the same stuff with audio context, uh, with the audio context API for JavaScript. And basically get an output that describes the machine's audio stack and use this uh, as a, an identifier of sorts. Or you could try to render an emoji and see what it looks like because uh, this will differ between platforms and applications. And uh, you can store this as a textual representation and try to compare between platforms. Uh, there was also um, uh, a little a neat trick a way back when, when they basically used uh, the CSS visited rules that allow, um, that, that allow you to style visited links uh, different from other links. Uh, where, where people would build large websites with, with a long list of common domains. And based on the visited styling, the visited CSS rule, uh, you could extrapolate what, uh, what domains the user had visited. You could use this as also to identify user to a certain extent. There's the uh, do not track preference and other preferences in your browser if you've taken a stance on this. Or you could just query the browser for uh, available extensions and plugins, installed fonts, use of local storage, and so on, and even see what platform and browser you're using, um, at least to a certain extent. Uh, and you can even, uh, for instance, using WebGL, you can derive very much information about your GPU down to the make and model, uh, and you could also benchmark a CPU to a certain extent. For instance, to find out whether it supports hyperthreading via running specialized JavaScript code. Now, all of these attributes I've described doesn't necessarily identify users precisely in and of themselves, but think about what would happen if you combine them. You could compare it to, um, in a very simplified manner, that how much information you'd need to make a person uniquely identifiable. This is a question about how many attributes you could reduce a person down to, right? You could use stuff like uh, brown hair, green eyes, pierced nose. And when, when defining a browser fingerprint, then we're really talking about a combination of enough features to uniquely identify the browser or the device, and by extension, the user. To 
basically the combination of all these attributes that aren't necessarily specific to you and in and of themselves. But when you combine them, they can be used as a specific identifier because they, in aggregate, they leak a lot of information about you. And this means you can be identified and tracked across the web, even without third party cookies or, or stuff like that. In reality, this isn't something new. Um, EFF actually released a tool called Panopticlick. I think the first version was released somewhere around 10 years ago. Uh, and th this tool will, will basically show you all your browser characteristics, uh, how many bits of information they leak respectively, and uh, statistics, like how many users, as in one out of X amount, that has the same attribute values as you. And there are also alternatives to this. I think one of them is called miunique. Uh, .com or .org, I can't remember. Um, but the question then obviously becomes, now, is this even legal? And the short answer is, of course, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't, don't really know. But I think it's legally questionable at best. And especially when you, when you see what's happening all across Europe post GDPR, where we're seeing data brokers being, uh, being penalized and prosecuted even. Real-time bidding, um, real, real bidding is, is struggling more and more um, as a consequence of this. So the entire ad tech field, which is largely based upon this type of stuff, is on shaky ground. And of course, it's a problem in and of itself because privacy is a basic foundational right, which is defined by and, and guaranteed to us by, for instance, uh, national constitutions, the European Convention of Human Rights, and the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And of course, users should really be able to decide for themselves, right? Um, because you could want to share data in a limited scope under certain circumstances uh, with some parties to perhaps gain some value in return. But this is happening without users' knowledge or consent, and that's a problem. There are some legitimate use cases for these techniques. For instance, you could, you could use some of them in combination uh, with other rules in, in complex sets of heuristics, maybe to uh, evaluate whether or not to invalidate user sessions. For instance, you could see that uh, uh, the session of a user, uh, no, sorry, the, the IP of a user uh, has changed uh, between user actions in, a, in one session. And maybe you then decide to force, force them to submit a capture or use uh, another, another factor for uh, authenticating themselves. Also, potentially you to detect bots or or just do plain old analytics and telemetry, uh, which would bring me to the legitimate use cases. Uh, they're, they're mainly derived from profiling in and of itself, in that uh, this, this sort of fingerprinting enables uh, fin fingerprinting providers to build profiles, which they then offer to others via third party um, uh, agreements as a service. And while they may not you know, have a reference to a specific user by name, they have a reference to a specific user. And this can then be used uh, with ad tech to, in order to deliver so-called targeted ads where they deliver ads that are uh, customized to you based on what content you've consumed earlier. And um, of course, it can also be used as an enabler of filter bubbles um, by, basically by doing the same thing, but with information and, and search results and so on. And it can be used by, you know, for tracking in general. It's, it's limited really only by your imagination. Um, so then you might ask, well, what's the solution? Is there a solution here? And there are different def defense mechanisms here. Uh, in general, you want to control the information leak. Now, you could disable JavaScript entirely and, and cookies as well, but then no, no modern sites would work in practice, really. So as a user, some of the things you can do, you can choose services and products that protect your privacy, like, like the Brave browser or maybe even the Tor browser bundle, even though you're then less likely, uh, or even though you're less likely to stand out statistically if you're using a, a more commonly used browser. Uh, you can also compartmentalize your internet use, like using different browsers for different purposes, which would make you harder to cross-track. 
Um, and you can use extensions like privacy badgers or, or do searches via DuckDuckGo, for instance. From a technical perspective, there are different approaches. Um, Tor mainly limits available information and disables features and it returns default values for some of these attributes. Uh, so Tor, for instance, just plain disables Canvas and WebRTC and also uses something called letterboxing, uh, which, which is basically that they have a set list of predefined uh, resolutions. And while, while users resize their window, their, their, the canvas on which their sites is being painted aren't really updated until they reach certain new breakpoints. Um, then browsers like Safari uses kind of a hybrid uh, approach in that they do local machine learning on the device to detect tracking uh, in addition to blacklisting. And most of the browser extensions basically or have traditionally used static blacklisting and are more and more doing dynamic blacklisting and, and trying to figure out more dynamic approaches as well. Um, there has been some research in uh, trying to uh, inject noise into uh, these values, uh, basically randomizing the attribute values that reflect uh, your browser and device features. But the danger here is that this can make you different enough to become a new tracking vector in and of itself. Um, then there's talk of privacy budgets, uh, basically limiting fingerprinting surface on a per origin basis so that you'd, um, you'd sort of uh, allow only X amount of calls to APIs that might leak partially identifiable information uh, ba based on one specific domain. But the weakness in this is that you would potentially be able to use aggregate results to reconstruct the original features by, by filtering out noise. So, so cross-site collaboration like third-party fingerprinters could still potentially identify you given enough data or in practice more page views. Uh, you could also identify or you could also um, imagine that browsers would maybe define general profiles, sets of attribute values and return these in any case, like redefine lists of install fonts or standard resolutions, uh, lists of extensions and so on. But this would also be challenging because you'd have to sync these API responses with what could be extrapolated from the DOM potentially. And uh, but if, if you could do this, it would, in a sense, let you hide in the crowd. As for future work, um, this would be an arms race, no matter what you do, really. Uh, so I tend to think that the only realistic, permanent kind of solution is a combination of better tools and legislation. Um, of course, browser standards around this would really help too. And there is being uh, a, a lot of great, great work being done here uh, in, in the W3C working in community groups. Um, and, and it is getting better in practice too, because some recent research claims it's gone from like 80 to 30% unique fingerprints on average now. So, so things are certainly looking up, but of course, uh, new vectors are, new vectors are popping up you know, uh, every so often. So no one really knows what the future holds. Um, and that's really all I had today. With that, I'd like to say thanks for, for looking at my talk.